So hello everyone, my name is Lee Nichols, and I'm the Editor-in-Chief and Associate Publisher of Hydrocarbon Processing Magazine, and of course want to welcome you all today. Now joining us is a very special uh, guest, uh, Leon De Bruyne, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Loomis Technology. We're going to be discussing with him the past, present, and future of the technology licensor. So it should be a lively, informative discussion. And with that, of course, I want to welcome Leon. How are you doing today? I'm fine. Thanks for having me here, Lee. <laughs> Excellent. So, we really, of course, first want to thank you for your time today. We know you're, you're really busy, so we really want to thank you for giving us a couple minutes. Uh, and we got a lot of questions, so let's go ahead and jump right in. Uh, we did meet first, I guess, in October of 2020. Yep. Loomis Technologies became its own uh, company. And so, just to kind of start off the conversation, I'm just curious, can you provide a quick update on how the past year's been? Yeah, well, it's a pleasure to be here, Lee, and uh, it's been a very, very turbulent last uh, 12 months, as you can imagine. Uh, the standing up as a, as a separate company uh, took a bit of energy at a time the uh, whole world was facing some challenges, uh, but we did it, and we actually uh, landed in a very good spot, uh, being a very uh, efficiently run company with our own systems, our own uh, structure. And more importantly, with a population and employee workforce that is extremely motivated to get us forward into the future. So it's, it's been a very rocky but very interesting ride so far. <laughs> well, that's true, yeah. Uh, and of course, we have to address COVID-19 uh, over the past year and a half. So the big question then is how has COVID-19 changed the process technology licensor? And then from Maluma's point of view, how do you see the current refining and petrochemicals market? Yeah, so clearly COVID has impacted uh, all of us operationally, uh, the whole industry. And I, I want to highlight a couple of examples where we have learned how to support uh, remote startups where our specialists, our technologists, through uh, digital products and devices, connect with the on-site staff of our customers and help them during the commissioning a startup or, or view, reviews of plans. Uh, which is a, an acceleration, I think, of something that was in the making anyway. So in some ways, COVID helped to accelerate um, uh, technologies getting into our uh, business. And uh, the, the other thing that I notice is the uh, interaction has to be far more planned and more, uh, I would say, crafted ahead of time. So our interactions when we look at investment configurations of our customers and help them to configure has to be more static than when we are uh, meeting face to face. And I'm really hopeful that uh, as the vaccinations are getting rolled out, that we get into a more collaborative mode. Uh, certainly, I think our customer facing relationships are a little bit struggling, and I, I sense the same from our customers. So, but we'll, we'll get past it with the vaccinations. Mm -hmm. Like you and I both vaccinated. It's nice to be I here in person. Fully, fully <laughs> vaccinated. It, it's nice to finally be face to face. Yeah, isn't that the truth, huh? Uh, people, I think, are starting to wonder if I'm actually real or not. Um, now, <laughs> one of the questions that, of course, I'd like to address is, are you witnessing any specific processing technologies that are leading the way within the industry right now? Yeah, so clearly, while the refining sector is struggling with less miles driven and uh, miles flown, uh, we see a surprising increase in the petrochemicals demand. And we talked a little bit about this, uh, Lee, in, in October. And it seems that it's a sustained demand increase. Uh, I believe it's caused by different consumptive behavior of uh, consumers around the world. So that has led to more packaging needs, more uh, petrochemical needs that feed into the polymers that make pa packaging. And so that is clearly a step up. And as you have seen many announcements of our business, we are more active in petrochemicals now than we were a year ago, which is a bit surprising and positive. And then the other driver behind our activities is really the energy transition. And we'll talk a little bit more about this, uh, Lee. But we have been so active in rolling out new technologies that support energy transition or technologies that we already had and fit much better with the energy transition. Uh, for example, the Celuria technology, where we capture methane, stranded methane, or methane that is normally uh, flared and convert that methane to ethylene, propylene, petrochemical building blocks in an economic manner. Now that has been helped by a, more, a, bit of a bigger awareness in the market that methane should not be flared or worse emitted to atmosphere as a greenhouse contributor, but should be monetized on. So 
I would say the energy transition related technologies are getting more and more momentum. And I'm glad you mentioned that because with the energy transition that's going on right now within our industry, how are government regulations and initiatives shaping the processing industry? Because a lot of this, of course, is coming from governments. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. It, it's, it's almost, to me, like the governments have either used the COVID situation or capitalized on the COVID situation to accelerate their agendas, uh, to support energy transition and carbon footprint uh, reduction. Uh, many of these policies were already in the making or had enough societal momentum to get the attention of policymakers. But we see in Europe, here in the US, and other uh, countries, uh, politicians implementing their agendas to roll out a far more favorable investment line for carbon footprint reduction technologies, circular uh, technologies, for instance, to recycle plastics, and also support those investments with what the governments need to do to, to augment what investors can do, for instance, on the logistical side of uh, waste recycling and so on. So uh, clearly, a tremendous shift in the last uh, 12 months. It's, it's amazing how fast this has happened. No, that's the truth. And, and I'm glad you mentioned things like circular economy because we're going to get back to sustainability here in just a little bit. Uh, now, you did talk a little bit more about shifting uh, product production. So my next question is kind of a two-parter is, have you noticed a shift in owner-operators and product production? I know you mentioned uh, the turn towards you know, incorporating more petrochemicals uh, into product production. My question is if you have any additional details on that, as well as how can technology licensors capitalize on that production shift? Yeah, so, so first I want to start with our industry has a huge history and knowledge uh, to make things work. And we have shown for over 100 years in our industry that we know how to convert hydrocarbons to useful consumer products. And that has not changed. In fact, that's what I think our industry is capitalizing on. So when we talk about sustainability energy transition, it is not dissociated from our industry. In fact, it's completely commingled, integrated in our industry. And I don't think the sustainability investments would happen without all of the support and knowledge that is embedded in the industry. So when you talk about operators and what, what you, we see in their production cycles, we see our, the operators using their existing assets to either repurpose them and make them more suitable for the changes in demand, or, and or I should say, we see them co-processing along with the conventional fossil-derived uh, fuels co-processing circular products. And I'll give you an example. We have this waste plastics recycling plant that has been operating for a couple of years now in Tyler, Texas, not far from here. And that, that plant produces what I would call a sink crude, others call it a, a pie oil. That can be co-fed into a refinery or petrochemicals complex alongside with fossil fuel derived feedstocks. And so this co-feeding allows using the existing assets that are there to pivot gradually but surely to where the society is, is headed. More circularity and I think it's a healthy pivot because instead of burdening the investments with a complete greenfield requirement of, of returns, we actually use existing assets which is a, in my mind a faster move into the sustainability. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent, a great point there. Uh, I want to shift focus here a little bit now towards another area that's we've seen a huge acceleration in adoption, and of course that's digital technologies. I know we've talked a little bit briefly about it last year. Um, can can you talk about how technology licensors, of course, like Lumis, utilize new digital technologies? And of course, the biggest thing is what kind of benefits can they bring someone like your company? Yeah. So I, I always like to start with I my family, my mother's side is a farming family and I know tomato farming pretty well. It's amazing that in tomato farming there is far more robots and digital products applied than we have in our industry. <laughs> really? Did you know that? <laughs> no, I, no. So, so our industry is really lagging in the digital wave. So what we did is, since October we formed a joint venture called Lamas Digital together with TCG Digital. This 50-50 joint venture addresses exactly the need for our industry to, to transition. Digitalization, whether it's remote monitoring, anticipative controls, preventive maintenance, all of that 
good stuff. It leads to asset maximization, better use of the assets, better return on the investments, but also adaptation to changes, whether it's seasonal or, or sustained. So while we roll out these digital products into the market, not just to new plants, but also to existing plants, I believe we can accelerate the, the change that we see happen uh, from the conventional, traditional business that we have to a more commingled business, but also use the assets more wisely with, I would say, a better carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. So more field trips with your engineers to tomato farms. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I, would, I would love to host you. Next, yeah, next right. time I'll host you. We'll have a, a, a day three of IRPC. We'll do a, a field, field trip. Uh, so great. Now, of course, what I do want to get back to in, in something that has been stressed over the past several years, of course, is not just this energy transition, but of course, the term sustainability. So yeah. what role is the processing licensor going to have in this energy transition? Yeah, it's, it's really, in my mind, it's impossible for one party, whether it's operators or technology providers or uh, EPC companies or uh, maintenance com uh, companies to cause the sustainability, the transition um, independently. This has to be done by collaboration. Everybody has to work together to, to drive the sustainability of our industry. Uh, there is knowledge needed from the operational side, there's knowledge needed from the technology side, from implementation. Uh, there's, there's a lot of new knowledge from material science because some of these circular uh, feedstocks or bio feedstocks have different, a different nature and have a different impact on the metallurgy than we are used to. So all of us have to work together and not to forget the, the digital need, right? So we have to work together. So for us as a licensor, we have to be hand in hand with our customers and all our uh, market players. We have to work together, uh, bring what we can bring. So the digital products, di digital expertise, our technology expertise, whether it's process or catalyst or equipment design, and bring that to the whole equation. So. A few examples, uh, and I want to give you a scoop. <laughs> we have been working hand in hand with a company called Synthos in Poland. Uh, they are one of the largest producers of rubbers, uh, certainly in Europe, perhaps in the world. And many of these rubbers make their ways into car tires. So we've been working with them uh, as they aspire to produce a more bio uh, derived rubber for car tires. So one of the building blocks in rubber is butadiene, as you know, and they have, uh, they had the vision to produce bio-derived butadiene. So we're helping them on the implementation, and uh, we just signed that arrangement. Very proud of it, and this is where a major operator like Sintos and us as a technology provider work hand in hand. At the end of the day, for the benefit of our society, making more bio components in our car tires. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely, and, and that's the way the industry is going. And I know we talked about this earlier. Was was everyone is now switching to these type of uh, renewables, biofuels, biofeedstocks, things like that. So uh, it's great. Well, congratulations on that. It's and for the and for the exclusive. <laughs> it's it's a fantastic news, and and it just shows if you collaborate and you respect each other's inputs, you actually get to new solutions that benefit everybody. Right. Absolutely. So I do want to take a deeper dive into sustainability because last year we did uh, talk a little bit about Loomis's Green Circle business yes. that you launched. So I was kind of curious if you can go a little bit more detail into that business unit and of course you know, how it's doing, what it's about uh, for people that might not know about it. Yeah, so for those who don't know, Loomis established Green Circle in October last year, just before we met. Mm -hmm. and. Um, the, the, the focus of Green Circle is to address the much needed uh, circularity in our, in our business, uh, bio-derived feedstocks when we process uh, technologies, uh, the decarbonization, and the whole purpose of Green Circle is to create a platform where we can bring the longest technologies to the market, but also third-party technologies to market. So create a bit of what I would call an open source platform that we can collectively leverage and accelerate technology products to the market much faster than when individual inventors would have to do by themselves. 
And we've, we've been quite successful. We signed the, uh, the arrangement with uh, New Hope Energies uh, last October and are very fast accelerating the technology that they developed and have been operating on for a couple of years to uh, third parties in the market. Uh, there's, there's many in the pipeline and, and I'm convinced that in this year we will see a few of those plastics recycling plants pop up. Uh, second is uh, the decarbonization, so blue hydrogen, of course, uh, it's, it's a natural fit with what we do. We, we have the Haubaker hydrogen technology, we have our gas processing, uh, CO2 removal. By combining them in a smart way and then having a deeper integration than just a link up allows us to have a more efficient blue hydrogen process. So that, that is in, in green circle. And then I mentioned the biochemistry, right? So like Sintos, there's, there's quite a few biochemistry process technologies that we have been working on, either our own or our partners. And Green Circle is the right home for it. And my vision is five or ten years from now, Green Circle will really be a vehicle of all our process technologies to the market where uh, circularity matters, carbon removal or reduction matters. Uh, and uh, I'm convinced that we will be successful capitalizing again on the knowledge that we have built up on our uh, traditional technologies and our compatibility with our clients using their existing assets as well as adjacent investments. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, my last question for us, I need you to put on, on, on I need you to open your crystal ball here. Um, but, and I think I might know some of the things that you might address here just because of the discussion we've had, this, we've had today. So, my big question is, as well as I'm sure many people that are watching this, is what does the process technology licensor look like in say 10 years, 20 years, 50 years down the line from now? Well, 50 years is a, is a bit far for me. I, I might not live to, to witness that. But No one will know you're wrong then, it's fine. <laughs> so, All right. So I think when you have this long-term view, which we often ask ourselves these questions too, where do we see ourselves in 10, 20 years? You start with your, your customer. And the customer for us is the consumer in the first place. Uh, combined as, as individual consumers, but also industries or, or hospitals, data centers, other consumers of energy products, whether it's power or hydrocarbons or transportation fuels or, or petrochemical products. So when you start there, clearly there's a societal drive to more circularity. And I think those who, who have not seen the need for circularity, especially on plastics, are, are missing something. And I'm sure you, you agree with me on that. Mm -hmm. So I think consumers are going to drive this by their purchases of products. Um, I can see that also the need for reliable power and other uh, energy carriers by, for example, hospitals and data centers are going to be more prevalent than they already are. Uh, that's, that's going to drive renewables, whether it's power production from solar, wind, or other renewables. Right. And then finally, wh what I see is the need for us to integrate all of those demands with the existing assets that are there and work with our customers, Lomas' customers. So when you ask, what does a licensor, a technology provider do? Well, it's our job to innovate. It's our job to bring those innovations to a commercial state and bring them to the market so that they can benefit our customers and the consumers as they go about their business. The reliability of, of what they resource from, the circularity to minimize waste, uh, the carbon footprint reduction are all going to be key ingredients. And finally, the economics of what, what they buy. They want to be able to buy products or consume products in an economic way, which means our customers have to benefit from a lower capex, lower opex solution and augmented with digitalization to always keep uh, anticipating changes in demand. We have to play that role across that board. Well, it's definitely an interesting time. So uh, that's actually the last thing I have for you. I, again, we can't thank you enough for giving us a couple minutes to my, chat about my this. My true pleasure.